The Beginning of Time, A Primer for Energy Workers by Aileen Stedman, read by Denny Van. Preface. The writings here contain information obtained through intuitive downloads from the highest level of the Akashic Records. I am able to access this information because of my role as the librarian and because of my true home is the Central Sun, where these particular libraries are located. A glossary, a glossary of terms is provided at the end of the book that provides clarity and context for the information that we access which we encourage the reader to reinforce as the terms used in this work may have been different meanings in different spiritual traditions than readers be, may be familiar with. There are many instances where we hear people being able to read the Akashic records. The works that are described in this document come from the point of origin of creation and they are quite different than the term that may be used in contemporary understanding. The information that is contained within the libraries at the level is not written in any single language that is easy to comprehend, and it is often context dependent. It may also be multidimensional in nature, depending on the age of the information being accessed and the type of energy-based language used to record it. In the case of the oldest library, there was no language available to be used, so the creators of this library recreated the actual events that had occurred which could be experienced in the library on the smaller scale and in a way that is properly contextualized. When this information is accessed, the events are observed, but no changes are made to the record itself. The record is queried if needed by interacting with the information in a non-invasive way. And those observations are described in this work. This process is very complex as the experiments were often multidimensional in nature and without reference to time and space. Because of the nature and structure of the information in all of the libraries, some amount of interpretation is required. We have translated the information into our language as closely as possible in the context that can be understood by the reader. However, there are limitations to what can be translated, mainly due to the limitations of the English language. Although this book discusses the formation of life, matter, existence, and the current incarnation of some of the souls, ultimately responsible for this, it would be incorrect to assume or believe that any of these incarnate souls could or would heal an individual of any disease, illness, genetic anomaly, or social condition using the knowledge they possess. The reasons are relatively simple. These individuals will not gener generally violate the free will decisions of any other individual including those decisions that may have been made prior to an individual's current incarnation, of which they may not be consciously aware. The modalities or the maladies that any individual may have are guided by the soul contract of the individual and were, and were chosen by the soul prior to coming into this incarnation. An integral part of the soul contract of every individual includes the social and societal constraints that are chosen by the incarnate soul, selected in order to best allow for the maximum opportunity of the resolution of karmic debt and karmic balancing during their life. The free will decisions of a soul allow for the individual to be involved in each incarnation's direction and lessons, and once that free will decision is made, it should not be interfered with by, other, by any other soul at any level. It is important to keep in mind that when an individual communicates with their spirit guides, their soul or their source, they are only provided the information that they are ready to receive at that specific time. This is by design decided prior to an individual's incarnation into each life. 
Too much information will overwhelm a person and may also cause an individual to make decisions that are not in accordance with their soul contract or their path in life. While this dynamic can be very frustrating, it is often of the individual's own choosing and in their best interest. Karma is an incredibly complex concept by design. It does not generally involve the actions of any single individual, but many individuals under many different potential circumstances. Each decision made by an individual may result in the placement of that individual on a different karmic path that has a bearing on hundreds of thousands of other souls through the interactions with their own soul contracts or soul paths. Without knowing the entirety of the soul contract of an individual, it may not be appropriate to make decisions regarding the path or healing of an individual or expect any actions to change the path of an individual. This is an essential consideration for all, especially energy workers and healers to understand. It is not our intention in this book to provide every detail of all of the constructs or even one of the constructs def defined herein, or to explain the details of the life contract that have evolved either on a local level or the level of the central sun. To do so would require a duplication of a significant portion of the libraries and the language translations would be exceptionally difficult and time consuming. The goal here is to present information which has never been published or released before in any time period anywhere, which will hopefully shed light on how and why all that we know as creation actually occurred. Much of the work of the constructs is still considered a work in progress. This is an awareness that there may be many questions that come from the information in this book. It is our aim to continue providing relevant information to readers and to address these questions through future works. Chronology. This chronology is meant to provide context and serve as a brief over overview of events, which will later be addressed in further detail. This information is presented here in order to provide an accurate account of how and why creation began, as well as an overview of the processes involved as they are described in what many know as the Akashic Records. We understand that much of the information presented here may be considered controversial and may not fit into a traditional understanding of life and existence. It is not our intention to encourage a change in belief structures, but rather to present the information we have available to us for contemplation and reflection by those who may be ready for a new and different perspective. At the highest level of existence, that of the central sun, there are a total of four libraries, each containing information from a different time period. These time periods are referred to as the before times, the first iteration, the second iteration, and the third iteration, with the third iteration being the current iteration of existence. The later three time periods known as the iterations are essentially experiments of the constructs and their development, each of which involve different stages of the development and organization of all that exists. These experiments Experiments were ultimately created after the conscious energies and existed in the first time period, known as the before times, had developed to the degree that they could experiment with the capabilities of energy and eventually existence. The before times was a period in which energy was the only thing present. Time, matter, and anything physical did not exist initially, nor did any kind of order. In the archives of the library for the before times, there is no indication or presence of any type of higher force or energy. 
The energies just existed. This time period lasted approximately 400 to 500 billion years. Approximately 250 billion years into the before time is when consciousness began to form. And in the later portion of this time period, 375 billion years, is when the first developments of matter began and were initially by accident. The before times ended when all that existed went back to a single point source of energy, with the exception of a few hundred small energy groupings. This energy collapse occurred intentionally, and this decision was made after the developments and work done by the energies that existed at the time had advanced enough to form an organized experiment to explore the characteristics and potential of existence. The different aspects of this experiment are known as constructs, with each construct being an aspect of the plan organization of existence. The point source of energy remained after the collapse of the before times for several hundred million years until the energies that chose not to be pulled into the point source initiated an explosion which began what is known at, in the libraries as the first iteration. The energies released by that first explosion were not meant to scatter over a wide area. In the several hundred million years between the first collapse and the explosion, the energy groups that had the consciousness had planned to generate a relatively small dispersal of energies in order to be able to travel between different energy groups with reasonable ease. This helped to keep the experiment relatively controlled and to allow interactions between energies to occur with greater ease. The first iteration existed approximately 50 billion years and was contained within a space of approximately 2,700 light years. This time frame for the first iteration was designed to allow for necessary experimentation with the concepts that were being developed by the energies involved, while also providing a safety net should any unexpected anomalous circumstances cause a complete failure in the experiment. This iteration was large, largely successful in its developments and ended in, at the completion of the 50 billion year time period when, once again, all energy and matter were drawn back into a single point source where it would stay for another few hundred million years. The energy beings who had formed the first concept of matter and physicality, known as the physical construct, and the beginnings of the groups involved in the remaining constructs were not drawn into the point source. Just as before, they planned what would happen in the next experiment of creation. The second iteration began with the second explosion of energy. This explosion was highly lar slightly larger than the one that created the first iteration, and it dispersed the energy over an area of approximately 5,000 light years. The second iteration was the last for a time of approximately 120 billion years and ended in the same way that the first iteration did. The souls that were involved in the development of all of the constructs were again kept from entering the point source of energy. This time, though, the point source of energy was kept for approximately 100 million years to allow for all of the construct energy groups to have enough time for their planning and initial development work. The third iteration, which is the current iteration of all that is, began much as the previous iteration, except this time, no constraints were placed on the expansion of the energies. We are currently approximately 14 plus billion years into this iteration, which it is planned for approximately 200 billion years. During the periods of time between the iterations, all soul energies or energy groups that did not return to the point source of energy were brought back to exist in a single 
non-point location where all work would be performed. This location also contained the and maintained the point source of energy for each iteration. This location and all that would come from this place would later come to be known as the central sun. The timeline, zero to 100 billion years. Energy exists, then ultimately begins to coalesce into groups of like energies initially, then groups of different energies. 250 billion years, awareness occurs, then consciousness begins to form. 300 to 350 billion years, first indications of matter forming. 475 to 500 billion years, formation of the first four constructs are formed physical, time, space, and interface. 500 billion years. Before time's end, energies retract to single source point. Several hundred million years pass to regroup and plan. Work begins to conceptualize the life construct and the remaining constructs. 500 billion years, source point explodes. First iteration begins. 500.1 billion years, work on life, transport, and oversight constructs begin. 500.2 billion years, souls are defined from basic energy groups. 520 billion years, construct leadership assigned. 550 billion years, first iteration ends, energies retract to single source point. Several hundred million years pass to regroup and plan. 550 billion years, source point explodes, second iteration begins. 770 billion years, second iteration ends, energies retract to single point, source point. 100 million years pass to regroup and plan. 770.1 billion years, source point explodes, Third iteration begins. 784 billion years, current time. The Librarian's Trip Home. I, Aileen, have known since a relatively young age that I have unique abilities. I know that I can ask a question and get an answer no matter the question. I have long known that one of my purposes here is to evaluate DNA to determine what changes may need to be made, even though I had no idea what that might entail until the last couple of years. I have known for several years that I was supposed to figure out how to preserve music, even though I did not know why or how that could be accomplished. I also know that I have some rather exceptional energy healing abilities and I am even better at evaluating energy flows within the body to see where issues may exist. I have healed the energies of DNA in the past for a small number of people where this was possible. I can also intuitively see very subtle interactions in the energy flows of a living being. Know what that vibration means or that variation means and then correct them either through my own energy work or through guiding life choices. I am also aware of my ability to use and at times project very large amounts of energy. I communicate and work with spirits on a regular basis. I am able to look at the soul's contracts of those with whom I do energy work. And I do past life regressions with people in order to provide them with other context in which to see events and people in their lives. Much of my training for all these skills occurred in past lives, many of which were as a Druid priest, primarily in Scotland and Wales. I have a significant amount of recall from past lives, and I am able to understand the significance of the knowledge gained and interactions. I have been to both Scotland and Wales, and both places are eerily familiar to me. At one point several years ago, I was shown a view of, my, of the past. My soul and the soul of another had been asked by the source of this universe to form a group that would be responsible for assisting planetary souls in their spiritual evolution and to help them 
transition to a higher dimension. Upon our acceptance of this project, one other soul and I entered the energy cloud of this source and sought out volunteers who were willing to separate from this source energy cloud and work on this assignment. A total of 76 souls emerged sequentially and this group of souls began to work the work of helping planetary souls ascend. These events occurred approximately 2 billion years ago and over time, this group would be responsible for assisting over 1000 planets on their journey. At the time I was shown this event, I believed that I was the leader of this group. I attributed this to my being the first to separate from the source energy cloud in this process, the fact that I had not been shown otherwise, and due to my not having been shown my work prior to this point in time. I was also aware that this planet had been trying to ascend for the last 1 million years without success for a number of reasons, but could never have guessed this events the events that would unfold over the next few years. I have learned through these experiences that when someone embarks on a journey such as this, they are only shown what they are ready for. When I was shown the soul, the soul group emerging from our current source, I was not yet ready to be shown anything else, only a relatively small amount of information. That all changed in June of 2017, when I met someone who I knew by sight as my equal on both a spiritual and healing level. I knew nothing else about her at the time, other than we had some lives together. I will call her Mary. A ride in the chamber. In June of 2018, Mary and I met again and talked about some of the things that I knew that I was supposed to do in this life. Interestingly, Mary was also aware of her role to help preserve music, among other things. At a conference we were both attending, Mary decided to do a meditation in a special kind of chamber that was built by a mutual friend. I had already been working with this chamber previously, as several years earlier I had helped tune the first chamber that was built and instructed the builder on how to optimize its performance. The version of the chamber that I saw in 2018 had a different configuration, so a friend and I decided to experiment with this new version. We figured out that if we began to input energy into the chamber, the experience was significantly enhanced, and by doing this energy input, we could also see where the person in the chamber was going to, to energetically. Additionally, during this energy input process, we were taking in the energy stream to a location where we could learn as well. When Mary was in the chair of the chamber, we began inputting energy as before. Unknown to me, my friend was physically pushed off the chamber and not allowed to participate, leaving me to input energy on my own with Mary still sitting in the chair. As I did this, I watched Mary to see where she was going. I could see where we were and very far below us, I could see where I knew to be the landscape of our current universe. Above that landscape, I could see a layer of translucent clouds, uniform in size and density, stretching far off into the distance. Below me, I could see another layer of clouds above the lower layer of clouds that were somewhat larger and far, far fewer in number. When I began looking at where I was, I saw that I was in a cloudy area. And when I asked where I was, home is the answer that I heard. I then asked why I was brought to this place and to learn the truth was the answer I received. What is the truth was my next question. From that point, I was shown the answers in a series of images. I was shown that Mary and I had emerged from the central sun shortly after the Big Bang had occurred. Our task, I was told, was to teach and heal. As it turns out, Mary was the other soul who had entered the energy cloud of this source 
to seek the volunteers. Mary later confirmed that she was also taken to the Central Sun on her journey. And while she did not ask questions during her experience, she was shown what was relevant to her journey in this life. The second thing that I was shown was that Mary and I were responsible for the experiment on Earth, or Terra, as she is properly named. This experiment brought the five different races of mankind here approximately one million years ago and was intended to determine if the different human races, which originally populated other planets, could live and function together. Open up DNA by enabling my char many characteristics all at one time and see what would happen and assess what other genetic variations might be possible. Since the foundation of the life construct, this was the first time that DNA had been allowed to have so many possible characteristics enabled at any one time. Although the team responsible for the construct had ideas about what might be possible, there could not be certainty, in part because some of the characteristics were untested. The artifact. At the conference, prior to the chamber event, Mary and I were shown a dark disc with engravings on both sides, which was attained during excav excavations from a site in Western Mexico. The, the disc had a number of runic symbols and graphical depictions of beings and spacecraft on it. There were several people trying to determine what the symbols meant. Mary took the disc and placed it between my hands and hers, and at that moment, we both knew exactly what the images and symbols depicted. Mary and I had made the disc in the distant past and placed it where we knew it would be found by our friend in Mexico. One side had been created by Mary, and it showed her role in this life, one of helping the soul of the planet and her transition of helping the souls on this planet to transition as well. I had created the other side and it spoke of my role in the spreading of knowledge from the libraries. In the context of the events of the chamber, this suddenly made perfect sense. In the time shortly after the chamber, the stone disc experiences as our downloads and new awarenesses of our roles began to integrate we became aware that Mary and I were somehow responsible for the development of DNA, but because we did not know the full context of that statement, we did not know what that exactly meant. Being responsible for the development of DNA seemed like an enormous undertaking and responsibility and left us full of questions. We were not ready to hear more at that time and spent most of our next year integrating the meaning and magnitude of what we had been shown and told. The Central Sun. The Central Sun is my true home, the place where my soul originated and the place to which I will return. It is not a true sun like Helios is the solar system. Helios is the proper name of the sun. It is more of its own dimension or series of dimensions in which a different for each with a different purpose. It is home to no more than a few thousand souls, and it is a place from which all that is known and all that is originated from. What came to be known as the central sun, as it were all of the early energies of existence began to accumulate. It is also the location of each of the energy contra contractions and subsequent, subsequent big bang explosions that occurred at the beginning of each of the itinerations. In the time between the contractions and the beginning of the next itineration, the central sun was where all those working on creation did their work on the constructs, and it is where the three later libraries were established. For those there, the Big Bang explosion did no harm. The central sun is contained within a primary universe that is separate 
from any other universe, from a spiritual energy perspective, it is the 17th dimension. Its physical area volume will vary depending on its needs. The energies there are always maintained in perfect balance. The original energies of existence gathered here first, some able to form discrete energy groups on their own, but many were not able to for some time. Those that could gather together were to eventually become the first designated souls, and those initial souls were what would come to be known as the creators. It is these energies, which at the time were nothing more than accumulated energy, that were the first to gain awareness of themselves, then others, and finally developed consciousness. The central sun is where all of the efforts involved in the developing the constructs occurred. Once the early energies began creating physical, or what would later come to be known as matter, it was only then that the energies of the central sun began to want or desire to experience it. This, is, this was primarily because no other universes existed. All that existed was once part of the central sun. It was these constructs that provided the groundwork for all else, all that is physical, space, time, life. Once the foundation work had been completed, other universes under the auspicious of soul group from the central sun were allowed to form under rules that were established in coordination with the appropriate construct. A near infinite number of individual universes exist. When the management of these universes become too complex to easily manage, an intermediate level of universe were created to perform this management. Management teams for each of the constructs are always working there to ensure that any issues are resolved in a timely manner. Each of these management teams report to the leaders of the respective constructs, who in turn report to the leadership council. The leadership council meets periodically to establish policy and to resolve any issues that arise. The chair of the leadership council has led the chair of the leadership council was led the group since its inception. This soul was one of the original souls and was deeply involved in the development of the early constructs. Each of the constructs will be explained later from a high level. The central sun is also the location of the four libraries. The three later libraries, and at some distance, the first library. Collectively, these libraries have come to be known on Terra as the Akashic Records, but that nomenclature is unique to Terra and those that have been here. They are known by other names in other universes and in other galaxies in this universe. The three later libraries contain the information regarding the events in which of the three iterations and the fourth older library contains the accumulated knowledge of the before times. The later libraries were not written or encoded in a fixed language, but contain a number of different languages, many of which are no longer used or known. The earliest library has no language at all, but rather has energies that duplicate the early experiments. Information is derived from this library by observing the experiments in a way that does not interfere or change them. All that, it is, all that is in the earliest library has no reference to time or space, and those concepts did not yet exist. The events depicted there are not compressed in any way, so the experience involved in reading the contents generally, generally involve lengthy excursions through time. All of these libraries are in the 17th dimension. There is one other library, though it is not a typical library. 
It is the sole occupant of the 16th dimension, and it contains a record of the movement of all energy since the inception of the second iteration. The purpose of these records is to be able to track the movement or, or the use of the energy of creation. It was considered to be an appropriate audit mechanism to be used to analyze unexpected events. It may only be accessed by the librarian and the records contained are input through an automated process. These records are not associated with the concept of karma. Karmic records are included in the third, in the three later libraries. Even though this library is in the 16th dimension, it may only be accessed through the 17th dimension. There are a number of controls that were put in place early in order to maintain the integrity and safety of the central sun and its inhabitants. The main control is a requirement that any energy desiring to access to the 17th dimension may also do so if their own spiritual energies are 17th dimension energies. If somebody from the central sun should incarnate in any known universe, they will retain their access to the central sun if appropriate provisions are made to their soul contract. Generally, souls in any particular universe originate from the energy cloud belonging to the source of that particular universe. When each source originally made the decision to allow its component souls to incarnate, they separated from the central sun. These energies descended from the energies of the central sun, initially into the lower energies of their new source. It was only then that they were allowed to begin to experience life or physical, which is the true reason of existence. In each incarnation or life experience, events occurred in accordance with their free will decisions and soul contracts, the goal being to maintain a balanced karmic energy each existence with a balanced karmic energy enables an increase in the base vibrational frequency of the soul in order to once again be one with the energies of source. Getting to the library. I had a sense that Mary and I were not only souls present here as part of our work, I knew that there was at least one additional person at our level, but it would be some time before I would be able to put enough pieces of information together to identify that third person. Prior to the next conference, though, I was able to determine who the third person in our group was. I knew her, and I knew that she was in the desert southwest of the United States. As it turned out, there was only one person that met all of the designated criteria. She was also going to be at an upcoming annual conference. So it was exciting to learn that some degree of collaboration between the members of our group would be possible. This group of three was referred to as the triad, although I was eventually able to determine that our group actually consists of a total of seven incarnate souls each with a unique assignment, but all are part of the effort to transition the planet. The following year during June 2019, the annual conference of a group that we belong to, Mary decided to climb into the chamber once again. We have learned through experimentation that the chamber provides a ride home for one person in the seat of the chamber and one or two people outside. When one member of the triad goes into the chamber, the others in our group who are nearby may also take a journey. We are each taken home to experience another aspect of our realm, but others who are not part of our group are only shown information from their soul's realm, and even then, only what they are ready to see. Everybody who enters the chamber is shown only what is relevant to their past to their path in life. 
for an inaccurate beings, for in for as incarnate beings, there can be much that is too difficult or too vast to understand. In addition to experiencing a ride home, individuals in the chamber may tra travel to places within the realm of their creator source. However, since the members of the triad and our respective teams come from the central sun, we are allowed to go to any location we desire. The ride home is also limited by how much energy our physical bodies can handle. Mary had entered the chamber and I took a position at the side of the chamber and could hear the work of the chamber begin. I began providing energy to the chamber as I ascended upwards, as did Mary, reaching apex very quickly. We once again went to the central sun and I could see a cloud before me with an opening that appeared to be a door. Inside, I could see a large stone tablet about six to seven feet tall and very long yards were visible, but I knew that it went for miles. I saw no books, but extensive amounts of knowledge were maintained there. I asked where I was, and the answer that came back was the library. I asked why I was there, and the answer that came back was, you are the librarian. The contextual intent of those words, though it was not librarian as we know it, it was better understood as the keeper of all knowledge of all that is. In essence, it meant that I was the keeper of what we on Terra know to be the Akashic Records. Discoveries in the Library One of the responsibilities of the librarian is to make sure our work and the work of those in our group is documented, not just for our reference, but for all time. This process of documentation occurs on its own through process established processes established long ago. I was made aware that there are a total of four libraries from different iterations of all that is. They can be seen in the distance, but can only be accessed by the librarian, the assistant librarian, and Mary. The third iteration, which is our current iteration, has its own library, the next most recent library prior to our current one covers the second iteration, and a third library covers the time from the first iteration. There is a final, even older library that encompasses the events of the before times. These libraries are not in physical space, and etheric space is not quite accurate either. They exist and appear independently of both time and space. In addition to these libraries, each source realm has its own library that is maintained by others in its realm, which falls under the oversight of the librarian. On the left side of the stone tablet in the library, there are a number of lists. One list graphically depicts DNA. It is not in a common language, nor does it use common runes or symbols. It uses a complex language that I have not seen in this life, but am familiar with largely due to my previous work with it. The language conveys all of the characteristics of DNA, what each element is, what it was intended to control, where the codependencies exist and other locations in the DNA, and how it works. It is the total DNA strand and includes all elements for all beings and entities. Another list contains several tax, tasks that were exceptionally difficult from a development and implementation standpoint. This current transition of Terra appears to be on that list as item six of 17. Footnote one, in actuality, the leaders of any of the constructs may generally access the libraries in addition to the assistant librarian, although many opt not to due to the complexity of the information that is there. The terms of their incarnate soul contract may also influence their ability to access the information. 
Each list contains extensive information relative to one of the more one to one of more constructs. In addition, they contain details of the constructs activities and duties and subduties of the construct leadership. Most of this information is available to those originally from the central sun, but access is restric restricted to all others. It is also worth noting that much of this information is in a context that would be exceptionally difficult for most to adequately understand due to its multidimensional nature, the complexity of the concepts and the use of languages or energy writings that many are unfamiliar with. Additionally, the tablet contains the names of the planets that have transitioned to higher dimensions, not just in this universe, but in all universes. They are broken out by order of the group they assisted, if any, they are not always needed or requested. The current group with which we are working has assisted 1,053 planetary souls in the past 2 billion years. This number appears to be approximately half the amount of the next lowest group on the list for the same time period. The source of this universe, their parent, has requested their return to source for what amounts to be reabsorption of their energies, but the triad has resisted that call, choosing instead to let free will and natural events correct the problems and failures. The soul group has been assisting Terra for just over 1 million years, an unusually long development. This model of having groups dedicated to assisting planetary souls with their transition to a higher dimension is working. I am familiar with a number of other incarnate souls that are here working with and observing us with the purpose of taking the knowledge they are learning about this transition back to their home source realm to begin this transition work there. From the perspective of those here from the central sun, three factors of our doing have contributed to the problems with the transition of Terra. One, the overabundant resources given the, to this planet which were to be used after its transition, approximately 50% remains from what was originally provided for this purpose. Two, the complicating factor of the experiment which placed the several different races of humans here. Three, the opening up of DNA, which enabled a vast quantity of different and new possibilities to see what might happen. Unknown at the time, the unchecked population growth enabled more souls to be enslaved for use in harvesting the resources of the planet, mainly for beings not from this planet or solar system. In hindsight, the complete opening of DNA may have been an unfortunate decision. I did not provide enough structure for positive outcomes, and the lack of controls regarding characteristics such as greed have proven to be harmful. There may be a consideration absolving all karmic debt because of this, and the source of this universe has indicated a willingness to accept this karmic energy. The preservation of music. As I write this, I listen to music. I ask if music has existed in the ancient times. For the near ancient times of all creation, the answer is a very clear no. For the first ancient times, the answer is different. In one tribal civilization early in the history of that particular multiverse, one group did drum using common objects. It was documented in the library as rhythmical but simple and monotone. This drumming was used for early communication and served as a primitive language because this race had no vocal capacity, not even grunts. What is interesting about this information is that it clarifies the need to preserve music. It is clear from the information in the library that music has not existed at any other location in the universe ever before. It has only ever existed on Terra 
and only somewhat recently. The reason that it came to be has to do with the opening up and enabling of DNA to allow for nearly all possible genetic combinations. This is done by the leadership of the life construct to test the capabilities of DNA with a goal to determine what was ultimately possible. Music, specifically the ability to create and play music, was one of the things that was unplanned. Music was not something that was envisioned during the, the development of the life construct. It came into existence only by the creativity that was enabled by the opening of all the filters of the DNA. The ability to create music is one of the key things that is to be preserved so that all of creation may have an opportunity to enjoy its benefits. It is also worth noting that other forms of art also fall into this category as well. The libraries. There are a number of libraries also known as the Akashic Records. The purpose of the libraries is to provide a record of all that was, all that is, and all that will be. While there are an infinite number of libraries, there is at least one library located within each source energy cloud. They are contained at only three different levels. At the lowest level, the source of each realm is responsible for developing and maintaining the library that is specific to its realm. Each individual library is maintained by one or more librarians who are energetic beings whose sole function is to service and maintain the local library. No individual soul, except those mentioned before, are allowed direct access to the library in order to maintain the integrity of the information. The libraries, at their discretion, service and respond to requests for information from the library. Each library is subject to the rules established by the source of the realm of the library. These rules govern items such as access, individuals that may have access through the librarian, when and under what circumstances, in what manner or structure the information is maintained, and when the information is archived or sent to a higher level library for retention. Individual libraries may access their own libraries. They may access other libraries at the same level as their source, but they may only make requests for access to libraries at a higher level. Librarians from, the higher, from a higher level are allowed to freely access libraries at a lower level. Footnote number two, the management functions and access to any of the libraries are also subject to rules and guidance established to a, and approved by the leadership council of the Central Sun. Individuals who have an ability to obtain information from an Akashic record are only allowed to query information for their per particular realm and then only through the use of a local librarian. It is not possible for those making a query of a lower level library to access or have knowledge of what is contained in a library at a higher level. At the intermediate source level, the libraries serve as a record of all activities of that source. These libraries may or may not decide to also serve as a backup for libraries at lower levels under the realm of their source. The librarians at this level will also mediate any disputes involving the lower level libraries and serve as a liaison between the librarians of other libraries at this level of source. On rare occasions, the librarians at the intermediate source level may make inquiries of the higher libraries, but that does not mean that they will be able to access the information. I am aware of at least one librarian from this level who is incarnate on Terra at this time. There are a total of four different and distinct libraries at the level of the central sun. 
The current library is responsible for documenting all activities within creation and all events that have occurred in this current iteration of what is known as time and space since the time of what we know as the Big Bang. There are two other libraries, each one responsible for documenting the work of the seven constructs from the first developments and documenting all activity that occur prior to the collapse of all that is, which is what led up to two prior Big Bangs. There is one additional library from the time period known as the before times, the time when the concepts of consciousness were first formed. This library was established in a complex energy structure with no formal language. It exists as an energy form and those allowed to access it exist within it. And by doing so, they are able to access the information contained there. The three libraries of the modern central sun may only be accessed by the librarian, the assistant librarian, and the two leaders of each of the seven constructs. The older library may only be accessed by the librarian and assistant librarian. It is important to note that the libraries are not physical libraries. They are not written in any particular language. They are structured more as a re repository of energies that can take a significant amount of time and energy to understand. Footnote, page 32. There are additional restrictions as well. For instance, one who is seeking information regarding another individual, the information will only be in accordance with the sole contract of the individual. Normally, this means that they will only be able to receive information that is relevant to their current situation and status in life. This restriction also applies to spirit guides as they too will only be able to assist us access information that is relevant to the specific circumstances that they may be advising a soul about. The original library which recorded the before times was created through energetic concepts that took some time to develop due to the lack of structured language. The purpose was initially to serve as a record of the events that occurred in order to serve as a means to help keep from repeating events. The functions or concepts of to desire and to know needed to be fully developed in the energy construct that existed at the time in order to provide the impetus to create the library in the first place. This is prior to the development of any of the seven constructs. These concepts reflect what we know as emotions in the form of to desire and thought or ideas in the form of to know. Footnote number four. In this context, emotion refers to the simplest concept of desire and not to be complex dynamic of emotions experienced by humans and other forms of life. These were the very beginnings of the process we see in creation involving thought leading to emotion leading to action or manifestation. This process in some form exists in all energies that possesses consciousness. However, the degree with which emotion and thought exist within any energetic construct and the balance and complexity of these varies greatly throughout creation. The energies that existed needed many billions of years to develop and any resemblance of awareness of self or other like energies. The same is true for developing the ability to feel. This seems to have originated from the phenomena uh, of like energies being attracted to each other. With time, this attraction became a rudimentary version of desire. The question then is, is what does the most basic energy construct desire? The energy construct in its infancy was only aware of one thing that it could desire. 
which was more of itself or others like it. The process of like energies being attracted to each other and growing as a result of that attraction was refined into a more distinct and evolved capabilities of awareness, desire, and expansion. These abilities developed as a result of the neural natural phenomena that energy had already experienced as a process for billions of years. In short, the energies were aware and they desired to expand their awareness. The more refined and distinct these energies become, the more expansion would occur, which then resulted in more energy becoming available to use to develop complexities in this fundamental process of growth. One of those complexities is the ability to record what is known. If energy forgets what it once knew, it cannot expand nearly as quickly as it would constantly have to repeat the process of re-knowing each time it experiences a phenomenon. This would result in an expansion and contraction process that would very much limit the ability to grow. The library was created as a record for all that is known as an aid to growth. Consciousness grew out of this. The increasing levels of awareness that existed within the energies began to understand both what they were doing and the fact that they desired to increase their own energies. As the energies began to grow, they also began to do things with an intention or desire for a specific end or goal. When this intention combined with desire and awareness, consciousness was re the result of this evolution. The consciousness that created the library wanted to record its own development and origin, including that which had occurred prior to the creation of the library. In order to do this, the conscious energies needed to find a way to follow their development backwards as a record of the information of everything that had already occurred and had yet to be documented. This was done through two steps. The first step was to observe the energies that existed. The second can be likened to the retracing of steps where consciousness could actively follow the energy streams of what existed backwards and record those streams. The library began as an accumulation of energy structures that were intended to maintain a record of all that had occurred. The data that had been recorded in the library since its creation has been put there by a collective of dedicated energies. However, as the library expanded, more and more organization and management of the library structure, structures were required in order to properly catalog and find the information placed there. It was ultimately after several iterations that it was decided that there should be an individual with a supporting team that would have responsibility for the organization, maintenance, integrity, and access of the information in the library. The library is timeless in that it exists outside of linear time. However, it contains elements of time which were coded by the consciousness of the keepers of the library. The organization of the library is a direct effect of the cataloging of this organization by those who have access to the library. The Before Times. The records of the before times contained in the oldest library are complex and the information within, the, within the, this library is not discussed in any of the three later libraries except in the context of what else it would apply to life, for instance. The information used to describe these times is multidimensional and is encoded in the energy-based language that only exists in this ancient library. Much of what is here also has no reference to time, which adds to the difficulty in assessing this information. What appears to be the earliest records of the library indicate that only energy existed within the emptiness of space in the very beginning. 
there was no structure, no form, no physical, and no sense of as to where the energy came from. Long before the energy itself became coherent, threads of energy at the same energy level and vibrational pattern began to coalesce. There is, an, there is evidence that as energies began to coalesce, an attraction formed, footnote number five, from what is contained within the library, this attraction appears to behave much like an early magnetism, even though the, the energy had no mass or electrical charge at this point. That seemed to draw other energies with the same properties near, even though the differences in the energies were incredibly small. The energies would tend to gather and then flow in order to reach a state of equilibrium with similar energies. This was a process that occurred over billions of years. In some limited situations, and generally after billions of years, energies with dissimilar characteristics were also attracted to each other. There is no record in the library that described where the energy came from. It merely existed. There is also no record or indication of any sort of external entity, force, energy source, or any other energies beyond those involved in the records. We think of space or the medium in which the energy existed as being relatively uniform and smooth, but it is not at this time, which is not to imply that this has changed. It was slightly irregular with the, irregular, with the irregularities ranging in size from what we now know to be microns to a few single meters. These anomaly anomalies appear to have been de deformations or inconsistencies. There is no background supporting structure at all. There was just void and nothingness. The deformations took a number of shapes from point irregularities or inconsistencies to a multi-dimensional well similar in the shape to a 3D conical well of finite depth, which would act to capture and hold energies that went into it, if not known or surmised how these entra entrapment occurred. Time did not exist and motion of the energies was due solely to the attraction of like or similar energies. The inconsistencies in space were not fixed in a location and they did move in response to interactions with other energies. These motions were small, primarily due to the minimal influence of the energies and inconsistencies in space, and the different deformations and inconsistencies were not attracted to each other in any way. There is no records indicating the source of the deformations and in inconsistencies in space. They just were. The number of different deformations or inconsistencies in the fabric of space were and are finite. Besides the point deformations and the 3D conical deformations, there were other types of deformations and inconsistencies, but they are of fifth, seventh, and higher dimensionalities and difficult to describe due to the limitations of our language. The number of different dimensions at the time was 13. During these earliest times, consciousness did not exist, so there was no initial records of any of these occurrences. The records containing this information in the library came about after the de development of consciousness, but before the development of matter and time. These records were created for two specific reasons. First, when in a search for its own origin, the consciousness that developed traced its energies backwards and then began to document what was discovered. Se second, the energies began to document their actions as a means to stop repeating their efforts and to begin to develop and grow quicker with greater efficiency. 
It is from these early hi histories that this information was written. The initial efforts of the energies to document their history is first led to the need to document events sequentially. It is this sequential viewpoint that served as one of the reasons for the development of linear time during the work of the time construct. The early energies had a number of properties or characteristics which included state, which is undefined at this time, but could have several different values, eventually a basic awareness of similar energies, but not to similar energies, and attraction to like energies. These records indicate that there were a finite number of states of energy, specifically seven, seven different states or types. There is some indication that each of the different state of energy that existed in these early times later translated into various different types of characteristics when life began to develop in the first iteration and those that followed. The development of consciousness. Consciousness is not unique to the life construct and it did not begin with the life construct. Consciousness began when all was still energy long before the concept and trials of physical began. Awareness requires some discussion. Energy in a singular state, as in a single quanta of energy, did not exhibit the property of awareness, but it was still attracted to similar energy. It was only when a given number of quanta of energy were together that awareness became apparent the mechanism that made this possible is not known, and this awareness took hundreds of billions of years to concur, to occur. The number of needed, the number needed for awareness to become apparent could vary with the different energy states or types. The awareness that energy had was with respect to like energies. The aware energies had not yet become aware of other energies, only energies with the same type and state. Early in this process, the destiny of energies was too low for the energies to be able to interfere with each other. They all moved without constraint. And when they came to have an awareness of other similar energies nearby, nearby is a relative term that was not defined, their properties of attraction allowed them to be drawn toward each other. As the size of the aware, older energies became larger over time, footnote number seven. Larger is a relative term in the library. These terms refer to the amount of energy rather than the physical size. Back from footnote. Millions to billions of years, the later energies began to see the older energies learn to move on their own by manipulating the outer envelope of their gathered energies. By manipulating the envelope, the early energies could alter the magnitude of the attraction forces in a manner that caused the movement along a new major axis of the energy accumulation. They are still using rudimentary forms of awareness to allow for movement, but they had now begun to exhibit some of the early signs of being sentient. After several million years more, it was observed that different energies began to interact with each other in different ways. One of the energy would block another energy state from moving in a given direction. Another energy state would begin to demonstrate an attraction for another energy states. The observations describe deliberate movements of different energy states, and this was seen as further evidence of sentience. Several billion years would pass before it was noted, noticed that the different energies began to cooperate with each other to accomplish tasks. They demonstrated intention or the desire to achieve a specific thing or goal. 
At first, the collaborations were very small and short in duration, making them difficult to spot, but they were present. They gradually became more noticeable and the awareness eventually turned into cooperation. It was shortly after this, roughly 10 million of our years, that similar collectives of energies were observed working together. At this time, it was no longer collectives of similar energies, but rather small groups of all of the energies. They had discovered how to work together. They could break up into smaller collectives to accomplish objectives, and they could sense other collectives and interact with them. This was deemed the birth of rudimentary consciousness. The collectives were aware they could interact to accomplish tasks, demonstrating intention. They could alter the parameters of their collectives to work together toward common goals, but there was no indication yet of being able to communicate either individually or as a collective of any size. At this point in time, a significant increase in consciousness began. The energies began working together closely to explore their interactions and frequently change the parameters of their energies to create different responses. They began experimenting in an attempt to learn more about their environment and their interactions with the, that environment. They developed the ability to communicate as well, mainly to enable this work. Initially, this took the form of what we call now telepathy, even though this term is not completely accurate. They had no form, no were they individual or singular in nature. Collectively, they began to want more, so they started to experiment. Initially, the experiments consisted of growing and interacting, integrating their energies in different ways to test if they had any limits. The next step was to try to determine how small they could become and still maintain the same degree of consciousness. They found that approximately appropriately mixing their energies was the key and they could become as small as they wanted in this way. After several billion years more, consciousness had evolved. Experimentation had allowed the energies to begin to learn more about their own limitations. And through these efforts, they expanded their understanding of their own abilities. They learned that they could form a collective consciousness. They had awareness of their surroundings. They could create other energy forms, and they began to document what they had done, which was a critical step that would enable them to avoid duplication of efforts in their growth. This formed the basis of the first library. Exploring the origins of matter. At some point, the energies that existed began to investigate a number of small anomalies that had occurred during their experiments. There existed a playfulness in what these energies were doing when these anomalies first occurred. There was no plan or intent associated with what they were doing, and the anomalies just happened by coincidence. These anomalies were locations where the pure energies they had been working and experimenting with had changed in an unexpected manner. First of these anomalies was discovered when a group of base energies began to organize in a form that we would say resembled a torrid, but made of energy. Footnote, a torrid is a geometric shape that looks like a donut or bagel. They then began to increase their energy level at one end, and because the energy sought balance, that, that energy increase began to move through the spiral to the other end. The release of this energy buildup coincided with other energy streams beginning to transit through the center of the spiral. These energies experimented with torrids. Torrids is the technical name for the spiral of different diameters, as well as different 
diameters of the path that the energy balance occurred in. It began with a singular circle with the energy moving through the circle. Then energies near this circle were drawn to it and were then pulled through it. They experimented satisfaction as being able to do this. They kept varying the parameters of what they were doing. They went on for several million of our years. During one of these torrid experiments, the energies moving through the center increased in speed, which was their goal, and emerged from the outer end, the other end of the torrid. Eddies, or nonlinear disturbances, developed in the energy, and the turbulence here caused a significant compression of the energies to the point that it could no longer be identified as energy. It was now something else. This anomaly occurred in the most complex torrid that had been formed at the time. Torrid smaller in length had been made, but this effect did not occur. It is important to remember that at this time, the energies that existed had no concept of time. Time did not exist, nor did they fully comprehend the concept of space. So a million years of our time may have seemed like a very short time to them. These energies had no concept of what we know of as math or science. They gave every appearance of being like children, playing with new toys in a way they considered fun. They also had no formal language and their ability to describe what was happening was very limited. When it came time to document what they were doing, they recreated the experiments in the library for future reference. And it is by observing these experiments in the library that this information has been extracted. The patterns of the anomalous energy objects they created were one, the condensed energy had no spin, no mass and no change. Two, the concentration of the energy was approximately 14 times more dense or intense, a more appropriate term, than any other energies before. Three, the density existed for a re relatively short period of time, in our terms, approximately 150 microseconds, and then it returned to an energy state as it had been before. Four, the energies, while in the state of increased density, did not process the property of consciousness. After the return of their prior energies, the energies that had traveled through the torrid were unable to describe any aspect of the experience and had no recollection of what happened, but all of the other energies involved did. The object that was formed was not like any current elementary particle known to our science. It was extremely small in size and it dissolved not through decomposition, but through a rapid dissolution of energy, which was a result of balancing all of the energies involved or the energies in the immediate area. They were able to recreate what had happened in every respect, so they once again began to experiment, varying the parameters of what they were doing. Initially, this was done very informally. They varied the following parameters. One, the length of the torrid by adding additional turns at first and then by increasing the spacing between the turns. Two, the diameter of the energy flow in a circular torrid, the thickness of the rings. Three, the amount or quantity of the energy that went through the torrid. Four, the direction the energy flowed in the torrid, clockwise or counterclockwise. Five, the outer diameter of the torrid. Six, the number of concentric torrids used. By varying these six parameters, singly or in combination, it was found that other anomalies would occur. For example, some of what was created was stable and did not return back into the energy, but in, instead remained in this new state. In continuing their experiment, experiments, 
they discovered that their creation sometimes had different properties. Depending on the parameters of the experiment, it could spin sometimes in opposite directions. It had a charge, although they did not know why this occurred or what it could be used for. And in some cases, it was quite dense. They also found that some of these creations had an affinity for each other. In total, the library indicates they were able to form 19 different creations. They also found that some of these creations would spontaneously combine to form other creations that were larger yet and had different properties from the others. They were initially careful to do their experiments in isolation, in part because they did not know what would happen or what their creations would do. When looking in the library at these experiment, experiments, there is no reference regarding the amount or quantity of energy that was being used or generated. The energies had no means to quantify this in part because of a lack of language, but also because they did not truly understand the magnitude of what they had done. As observed, this would appear to have been a limitation of their consciousness. It was at this point that it was determined that a more formal process was needed when working with the cr new creations. A number of the primary energies that had been working on these experiments were selected for this task. They would become the first members of the physical construct and their sole task was to determine the possible combinations that would work together to form other creations and to begin to document their work. They began to accumulate their new creations, initially holding them in the wells that existed in space. Over the following few million years, they began a process of combining the 19 creations in every possible combination. And they ultimately found there were to be 147 different greater creations that could be made with the original 19. Most were stable, and those that were not stable in one realm or dimension were stable in another. Not all of these creations existed in one realm, and their ability to exist is dependent on the properties that were later established by the source of the universe they were in. History of the Constructs. Near the end of the before times prior to the first iteration, it was realized that there was a need to develop a formal process to document a number of proposed and actual efforts and to identify future efforts or activities. A small group began working on a construct for physical, which initially included what would become matter. There was a need to formally document what was being done, the results, and then develop further work based on the knowledge obtained. This work continued into the period of time between the before times and the first iteration. During this time period, there was an understanding that there were several different areas for which development might be possible. Some would need to wait until after what would become the physical construct was well underway, but other areas would not need to wait. Those areas included the construct that defined space and another to define the concepts of time. Because much of this would involve some degree of interface or co-use, a construct involving the interface of all of these was also considered prudent. The decision was made that a group of energies would be formed that would be willing to begin working on constructs for these other areas. Each construct would have the same level of importance and priority, and cooperation became essential to ensure that developments in one area were not detrimental to other areas. It was understood early on that there would, there would need to be a level of complexity to the work that they were doing in order to ensure a satisfactory outcome. 
The energies try to determine what they should expect of their work so that in the end, there would be a, as few a number of surprises as possible. Later, this thought process would prove invaluable, particularly during the development of the life construct. It was clearly seen that life would, in most cases, be extremely fragile, and that seemingly small things could have huge consequences. Understanding the outcome of their experiments prior to doing them became the norm. Prior to the initiation of the first iteration, the work to develop the four initial constructs was aggressively pursued. There was a need to have as much of the initial design of the constructs completed as possible prior to the initiation of the first iteration. Each construct was being developed by a team of between 25 and 50 conscious energy groups. And subgroups were developed to work particular interfaces, interface issues above and beyond what was required by the interface construct. Shortly after the initiation of the first iteration, implementation of the initial construct designs began. And after a relatively short period of evaluation, 10 to 20 million years, the work of three additional constructs began. These additional constructs included the life construct, the transport construct, and the oversight construct. As happened with the other construct, each was formed under the guidance of a team of 25 to 50 conscious energy groups. In some cases, individual energy groups from the initial four constructs were pulled to work in a new construct, initially to ensure a minimum number of issues with interfacing. After 10 million years after the first start, after the start of the last three constructs, individual energy groups were formally designed, designated as what would later be termed souls. This designation was done in large part due to a request from the life construct team for as elements of life could be envisioned, it was apparent that a, that a reference to individual energy groups might become confusing when referring to the kinds of system of systems of life that might become. The intention was to provide an overall controlling mechanism for a life form that consisted of a number of other potential life forms or life systems. As in our current existence, individual soul energies have different abilities, aptitudes, and interests and after about 20 billion years, it became apparent that design by committee was not an optimal concept for the development of the constructs. It was decided that individual souls would be selected to manage and provide direction to the constructs. Each leadership team would consist of two souls, each of which has had experience in at least three different constructs. The choice of two souls to lead each of the constructs was decided in large part to ensure some degree of randomness should any issue arise when one soul was not present. Redundancy. To ensure some degree of redundancy should any issue arise when one soul was not present. In addition, subcommittees were to provide a soul for coordination purposes. This would all become more critical as each construct became more complicated. The assignments were for leadership positions for the following primary constructs. Physical construct, time construct, transport construct, life construct, oversight construct, interface definitions construct, space construct. In addition to having principles for each of these constructs, each of the principles received at least one additional assignment. Librarians, what we know now as the keeper of the Akashic records, mapping of physical space, maintaining common use of construct, wormholes are but one example. 
Physical constructs include both physical and time constructs, policies and procedures maintenance, levels access from commons, essentially granting access to different levels for those not in the leadership groups. Interface constructs compliance, governance of sources, a council to govern the lower sources, governance of higher sources, the Central Sun Leadership Council. Deviations processing, inter-realm working group, a council. Throughout the time prior to the assignment of the principles, some individual souls were moved or asked to help with the development of other constructs. The individuals asked to do this seemed to have unique skills such as troubleshooting issues, problem solving, organizational skills, and leadership skills. As a result, they would occasionally be needed in other areas. In each case, it was the com combined performance in several areas and over the course of billions of years that enabled some individual souls to stand out. And it was from this group of souls that leadership positions were made. In each case, each soul placed in a leadership position had worked in no fewer than three constructs over time. For the individual subcommittees, the leadership positions were assigned to those who had worked in two different constructs in some senior capacity. In each case, those paired in leadership positions had worked successfully together. Leadership assessments were made for those for the principals and with four exceptions, all assigned still stand. The four that were replaced included one for the physical construct, one for the time construct, and both for the interface definition construct. The leaders were replaced because they were assessed to not have the proper aptitude for those particular positions. It is worth noting that the additional assignments were not to involve the primary responsibilities of the leadership. For instance, those in charge of the physical construct would not be responsible or involved with the physical constant subcommittee. In the context of those in and of the central sun, those that are in charge of constructs are referred to as the creator for all that is in any construct, not just for their own construct. All know about each other, but it is exceedingly rare for them to enter the physical realm and even rarer to enter into an existence where they may meet. For their realm, they have no constraints other than those that they impose on themselves. For each member of the triad, there are between five and 10 staff who are available to assist us when necessary. Their origin is generally, generally from the central sun, but they do not have to be. The constructs. Physical construct, responsible for all that exists in the physical realm and defining how the physical interacts. This includes all forms of matter from basic elementary particles to all of the elements themselves. It includes gravity and electric charge and it includes all of the physical laws and constraints that would apply, as well as the conditions in which they would apply. This is not just to include the realm we currently reside in, but all other realms as well, including those considered multidimensional or multiphasic. Time construct. Responsible for all aspects of what we know as time, this includes simple time or linear time, nonlinear time, and several aspects of time too complex to describe with the limitations of our language or math. It includes the perception of time and all definitions, laws, and constants, constants involving time. Transport construct. Responsible for the movement through and of space time and the physical, governs the use of placement, activation, physical constraints, manipulation, 
and properties of wormholes, interdimensional conduits, and travel through time. Life construct, responsible for all aspects of sentient physical and etheric existence or life, including DNA. Alternate forms of DNA, RNA, constraints placed on DNA at any level, and creation of new life forms. Defines the constraints that must exist for placement and existence of life. Responsible for overseeing the ascension of life form from one dimension to another. Oversight construct. Responsible for oversight of all processes above to ensure any compliance issues are resolved. Responsible for compliance at all lower levels in the absence of any principal construct leadership. Interface definition construct. Responsible for des designing the interfaces or interaction between any two or more constructs. Also responsible for defining the inter interface between physical beings and spirit or energy beings, but not for the transition from physical to spirit. That remains under the life construct. Space construct. Responsible for all aspects of space not previously mentioned, includes celestial phenomenon, interactions of celestial bodies, and the definition of all related properties and cons constants. In addition to our staff, there exist here at this time a number of interface managers and a number of individuals who are members of the construct teams. Their role is to address any needs or issues that surface because of the current transition. Development of the life construct. When, this, when the decision was made to bring all energy back to a single point at the end of the before times, the group responsible for the life construct began work on a design for what would be known as life. Because the concepts and theories surrounding what would be known as life were largely unknown, it was felt that development of a single cell being existing within a simple environment would be the ne next initial choice. The first step in the process was to define the constraints for the environment that life would have to exist in, which required working closely with the members of the physical construct. There are some basic criteria that have been established during the initial work. Appropriate chemical structures would have to be identified. The physical structures would have to be capable of supporting the weight of the body. Suitable systems were needed to support self-sustainment. The construct would have to apply to any form or type of life. The life form could not suffer severe adverse effects by the environment it was locked in. The life form would have to be somewhat mobile. The life form would have to have a reasonable expectation of carrying out the goals and functions to support its existence. The life construct team spent several million years developing additional criteria for systems and subsystems by testing and testing hypothesis regarding the functioning of their work. Because of the enormous complexity of this task, it was decided that an incremental approach would be best. This meant beginning with single celled life forms and then testing them in a number of environments to determine if the assumptions that were made during the development process were valid. As their assumptions proved valid and the conditions varied over time, additional elements and functionality were added to the coding that would later be known as DNA. It is important to understand that the life construct is not just about DNA. While DNA is an important factor, the construct also was responsible for the development of structures, physical, environment, and social, to name a few, 
that would form the basis for supporting what would become life. It pertains to all sentient beings, whether or not they have DNA. Yes, some sentient beings do not have DNA. It is also responsible for creating the deliberate balance of life by looking at the host for a given set of life beings and determining the types of life forms that needed to exist and for what duration in order, in order try to, in, to ensure a comprehensive foundation for life to exist in. The construct also worked to project their work into a linear time construct that would apply to be able to adapt to the future needs of life as well. This work was not just done to, to support two or three dimensional life. It was done for all life in all dimensions and had to account for the possibility that life would advance from lower vibra vibrational energies that would easier support physical beings to higher vibrational energies where life would consist largely of energy beings. Another important element of the life construct is the concept of a soul contract. The purpose of a soul contract is to provide for a coordinated with other souls that may be involved to an extent in the life series of events that may be used as a guide to follow in a given life. It is an agreement between the consciousness of an individual and the soul of an individual, and it is negotiated prior to an incarnation. The soul contract can best be viewed as a tree, where is a primary trunk of the tree, and each of the various branches of the tree represents possible paths for a consciousness to take during life. Taking any particular branch involves a free will decision on the part of the individual. The intent of each path is to provide an opportunity to resolve karmic energies within the core being of the soul or to avoid the accumulation of negative karma because of events occurring due to free will decisions. The tree involved with a soul contract involves all of the likely main branches and possible smaller branches of the tree, paths that may occur during the life of an individual. Any decision that is made may ultimately change the path or direction of a life. Any decision or path may influence relationships with others. Those possible interactions are a large part of the time spent establishing a soul contract. Every individual soul that you could be involved with during an incarnation must be determined and the possible actions documented and determinations made how those will possibly impact others. The process to develop a proper soul contract is complicated and time consuming. When viewing the soul contract, a number of smaller branches becomes limited to approximately seven paths off the primary path. The reason for this is simple. If one were to make free will decisions that would ultimately lead them too far away from what their primary path is, the possibility of returning to that main path becomes near impossible. This being, it, in this case, those branches further out from the main path will lead to, deter to termination rather quickly. This is to help ensure that karmic energies do not get so far out of balance that destruction of the soul results. Regarding the interactions between the life construct and the physical, it was realized relatively early that these interactions would need to be well-defined. Identifying the physical, spatial, and temporal vulnerabilities of the life construct was some of the earliest work. It was observed that some of the early chemical structures would inhibit the life construct and in some cases dissolve it. It was also observed that some elements of the construct were more robust in complex environments. As a way of compensating 
more robust and dynamic filtering mechanisms were included into the life construct to eliminate or minimize the impact of some of the harsher chemicals they might encounter. Radiation was included, both ionizing and non-ionizing, because they presented different types of issues. It was known that either type of radiation would damage the construct to the point of changing characteristics or causing failure. Eventually, this became seen as a possible means of terminating the construct on an individual level, causing death. Even though much work had to be done, this was really considered early development work intended to verify some of the basic assumptions that had been made early on. It was believed that the best approach would be to develop a life, a single life construct that could apply to all manner of life. In this way, some degree of commonality could be obtained as any issues with the code would be seen in several spaces or species. So it should make troubleshooting easier. The life construct code and DNA. Given that the code itself would be responsible for the development of physical structures, a means to hide unused, undesired portions of code for any given species would need to be made and it would need to be done in a manner that made the entire code visible to only a few designated souls. Obviously, this would include the members of the development team and at times those responsible for some forms of healing, specifically to correct errors in the code prior to any form of mass events, such as an ascension from one energy level to another. All of the code would remain though. Because the construct is a manipulation of energy, someone astute in subtle energies might be able to sense the presence of the entire genome. But without the proper knowledge of the construct, would not necessarily be able to understand how to work with or within the construct. There were several levels of protection integrated into the coding. This was done in order to prevent the wholesale manipulation of the code or effective copying. There are a number of controls that were included, some at the visible portion of the code, some in the unseen portion. Even though the code was intentionally made very large and difficult to decode and understand, it was felt that the controls were required to ensure the sanctity of the work of the construct. At this point in time, the only ones who have access to the construct are those in the development group, the leadership of other constructs, those in the library, and three others who appear to be at the very far edge of existence. There are some individuals on this planet who have been trained to look for errors in the coding and to take rudimentary steps to correct the errors but only the errors they are shown are allowed to be seen. There are a total of 233 elements to the DNA in the life construct. In each element, there are 1,597 data points and each data point contains four possible proteins. There are a number of data points in each element that are devoted to housekeeping or maintaining proper characteristics within a species, defining the necessary processes and procedures required for a given species, maintaining longer term or karmic memory, maintaining a record of the soul contract for the current life, and maintaining the set of restrictions that have been placed on the construct by the source of the universe in which the life exists or originated if the life originated in another universe. The overhead includes the instructions for the termination of the current life, generally a number of possibilities as chosen by the soul prior to incarnation, assuming no outside influence and in accordance with the soul contract. 
Finally, the overhead contains the directions that govern what elements or portions of DNA must be hidden and how based on the species of the soul. Not all of these elements may be visible or accessible, and some of these will be hidden from view by a number of means. The rationale for this is not to expose all of the code so that replication or duplication is difficult. The life construct has a number of very basic requirements for any life created under it. One, souls must be bound to DNA in at least a semi-permanent way. Some characteristics may be determined by parents, but they may not be a hard requirement in every situation. Two, the soul of life must be bound by the requirements of the life construct. Three, life must be self-sustaining or be capable of self-sustainment. Four, life must be both sentient and conscious. Five, life must not be artificial and must have a soul. When a soul comes into existence in the given realm of source, of a source, its life construct will be restricted in accordance with the mandates which with that source created its realm. The restrictions could govern physical limitations, cognitive limitations, addressing of social interactions, and limitations of intelligence. These could exist in every element and location of the realm of the source. The restrictions are negotiated between the source and the staff of the life construct. In situations where the leadership of the life construct desires to attempt something new or further define the limitations of the construct, they may create a new location with characteristics suitable to meeting their needs. The life construct to be universal was developed using specific mathematical sequences. The universal nature was intentional to allow any number of the development team to access the construct at any time and any place. Each element of the construct provides for the details of a single aspect or operation of a physical body, even though many redundancies and interdependencies exist. This is in order to ensure the success of the unit in the event an element of the construct should fail or be compromised for any reason. Nothing relies exclusively on a single element or any part of the code, and all genetic factors are, are coded in different ways and in different number of different locations. For any given species, only those elements with relevance to that life and its function are included in what is apparent or visible. For entities that only use a portion of the element, for example, RNA, only those needed data points are used. Directions for how this works are contained in the overhead. The coding allows for a number of sensory inputs. The coding allows for a number of sensory inputs for all beings and species, even though restrictions may exist from the source of the realm therein. Some senses are known and overt, vision, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. Some are not, sensing magnetic fields, sensing life forces, and sensing time variance are examples. It is worth noting that the base frequency of the soul or life does influence what it can be sensed. For instance, an incarnate life that operates on a higher frequency of the energy spectrum may also be able to sense events in other dimensions occurring near them and may be more able to communicate via other means, telepathy, for instance. Raising the vibrational energy of an individual may also serve to protect that individual from many lower level energy events. For instance, raising the energy level of a being will offer protection to the individual from damage caused by low frequency and energy radioactivity. 
This was an intentional design criteria incorporated into the life construct as a means to offer protection against harm for those able to achieve this state of being. There are also variations in the parameters of these senses based on the parts on the needs of the species. Examples include animals sensing life forces, spirits, expanded audio frequency range and sensitivity for some animals, expanded vision wavelengths and smell sensitivity for some animals. Should a sensory receptor, eye or ear be damaged, the processing of the sensory input for, for other senses is changed in order to compensate. If a sensor is not used for a period of time, sensitivity may be decreased and the processing shifts to other senses. Therefore, if a sense is not used, for instance, sensing a spirit or energy, that sense will become dormant, but can be restored through training and use. It is important to remember that this is mostly a function of the processing ability of the life and not necessarily a function indicating an issue with the actual senses. Other things that are controlled by genetics include susceptibility to mental illness or acquisition of mental illness to help with resolution of karma from the past when they may have subjected others to traumatic events by providing understanding of the efforts or to limit activity. Gender preferences, identity, and characteristics to aid in the limitations of population growth or balance of genders to enable population growth in all other life forms. Susceptibility to and clearing of toxins to provide an alert to others nearby of possible non-beneficial chemicals or chemical combinations. Susceptibility and response to illnesses to cause a slowdown that would help them observe or to result in the termination of life. Intelligence to ensure a portion of the population that will be able to understand and develop advanced technical concepts to better understand the basics of the constructs and to allow for the balancing of past karma. Greed as an incentive to accumulate food, for instance, on a planet prone to harsh climates. It has historically been up to the source of the appropriate universe to decide what and how any restrictions in the genetics of an, the individual soul in their realm will be implemented. Terra was different though. Terra was provided with more abundant resources and to be used in development after its transition and the developers of the life construct decided to remove any hindrance with DNA to allow for all possibilities in order to see what would happen, something that had never before seen allowed to occur. As a part of this experiment, several members of the Life Construct team are present in several realms here to act as observers. The implementation of DNA when DNA is incorporated into a given being, there are many different elements that may be enabled. Some restrictions may be required by the source of the universe that the being resides in. For instance, greed is not enabled by some universes and some sensory abilities may be diminished in other locations. In the case of life on Terra, few restrictions were included in the implementation for humans a decision was made by the members of the life construct from the central sun. The life construct team had never before enabled most of the elements of DNA, and the goal was to see what would happen in a dynamic environment. So all sensory abilities were allowed, and in some cases enhanced, which included the less used senses, like clairsentience, clairvoyance, claircognizance, unrestricted greed, 
all genetic variations, including diseases and an extraordinary number of life forms. Over time, the library showed that a number of groups from other planetary bodies began altering the DNA of humans in order to obtain characteristics that were deemed beneficial to their efforts to harvest the resources of Terra. Much of this damage is in the process of being corrected by both light workers and the healers on the planet now. DNA, when it was designed, included an inherent ability to allow for its host being to grow and reach the energies of the source from which they originated. When the soul goes through life, and if their energies remain karmically balanced, their own vibrational energies will begin to rise to a point where they may graduate or ascend to the next spiritual level. DNA does support this process without any further modifications, enhancement, or activation. DNA was also designed as a single strand in order to support its use in all species of life. It was never contemplated to be split into different strands. In order to explain the basis of individual aspects of life to different groups of species, who did not have a comprehensive understanding for the basis of life. Groups from other planetary systems erroneously stated that there were many different strands of DNA and that each particular strand was re responsible for a different element of life. This teaching originated on other planets and then eventually spread to early Terran civilizations when beings from the other planets began to spread their knowledge to Terran society. Historically, the elements of DNA that have not been active in any given life are those elements that would meet one of the following requirements. One, a particular genetic characteristic is required in order to meet a requirement of the soul contract for a particular life, for instance, the loss of one or more senses. Two, a change in genetics to support the adaption, adaptation to an environmental issue on a given host planet. Three, genetic inactivations due to the requirements of the source of the universe of the soul or being. In every case, the change in the elements of the DNA are made with the concurrence of the soul involved. It is important to note that any attempt by one party to modify the DNA of another, which would include activation, would result in a karmic imbalance between the two individuals. DNA modifications of any kind may only be done prior to the establishment of an individual's soul contract and subsequent incarnation. Once an incarnation has begun, no further changes are generally allowed. When DNA was originally being designed, the intent was for it to be omnipresent. It was to be available in all places, including space at all times and in all dimensions. It was to serve as a seed for life to begin wherever possible. DNA was developed with this in mind. It had an inherent ability to adapt to most any environment in order to support and create life. In order to do this, DNA had to be sentient as well as conscious. At its purest state, the state retained in the DNA map created by the life construct team, DNA exists at and within the 17th dimension. When in areas where physical was present, DNA refer, reverts to the dimension of that physical and is then subject to the same restrictions as the physical, imposed, for instance, by the source of the universe that is in it. DNA, through the use of the DNA map held by the creators, and those of the life construct team can be changed at any time 
and any place. The processes involved may be accomplished from the celestial sun or from any location that those with the ability to may reside or exist. There are limitations specifically concerning free will decisions. The limitations related to those imposed by the source of the universe, the changes will be made. In the, and the changes are at the discretion of the leadership of the life construct. There is no aspect of DNA that requires activation in order to achieve a goal, including the act of ascending to a higher spiritual plane. DNA works with and in response to any energies present in its vicinity and any intentions these energies may have. If a given soul is ready for a spiritual advancement, it is karmically balanced. DNA has the ability to work with the soul to acquire the necessary energies required for that spiritual advancement. DNA does work closely with the soul of an individual to achieve any goals contained within the soul construct and the soul contract. Implementation of the life construct. As the concept of life developed under the construct, there was an initial desire to limit early existence to a single cell. In single dimension, in order to limit the observation necessary to verify concepts. As more complex forms of existence were developed for more complex environments, there became a desire to implement forms of life that were interdimensional, or they could exist in multiple dimensions at the same time. This is a capability that is enabled in the life construct. This was done in order, to in order for a soul or oversoul to have multiple life experiences concurrently and to allow for additional possibilities to balance karmic energies. The lives are, con the lives are conducted in parallel dimensions and are available in all forms of advanced life that include these elements in their active DNA. There is an inherent ability to sense some of the events in a parallel life if that particular sense is active. This sense is present in every life with this capability as an additional or non-primary sense. Throughout the early life of Throughout the early life construct developments, it was scripted. So there, there was no choices. There were no physical sensations. Nerves were muted. For those involved in the testing, there were no concept of pleasure or pain and no emotions. Reproduction was limited as there was a desire to limit the number of beings to maintain a level of positive control over the experiment and the life construct. There was a realization that life needed a place to go, a host that would be willing to support it, and that had the specific criteria that would be needed to encourage the development of life. So a part of the life construct required working with the other constructs, in particular the space construct and physical construct to establish requirements for host planets. These requirements included atmosphere, planetary dynamics, elements available, water content and quality, type of other life that could be supported, and other areas necessary to support any of the billions of different types of life that would be abled by the work of the life construct. So with this work started, the portions of the blueprint of life began to be developed along with some degree of customization of the blueprint that would allow life to be successful in a wide variety of planetary hosts. The first part of this was to assist with the formation of the planets, to ensure that their soul, their own life system were viable and stable, which was key to allow other forms of life to be brought to them. 
Different groups of species were individually on, on host planets so that only one genetic combination of life planet or non-plant life was present. This was due to begin varying parameters of the life construct to gauge impact. Lesser forms of life were included to provide for sustenance and balance, as well as a self-contained environment. Slowly, as more began to be understood about how the life construct was working, more alterations to the construct were made to increase complexity, but also to begin to understand some of the limits involved. There is an example of the magnitude of this decision by the life construct team. The main energy of the individual soul or a grouping of energies determined the blood type of a being in a way to maintain an identity and other original energies. Soul energies consist of a combination of the initial seven different energies. So there are a possible total of 5,016 when one takes into account the fact that humans have four different blood types. By definition, each organ is given body, a body by definition, each organ in a given body has the same energy signature or combination as the parent soul, since everybody developed under the auspicious or guidance of that single soul energy. However, when you introduce a foreign soul energy into a body, either in the form of a transplanted organ or a food source, keeping in mind that each food source has its own unique soul energy pattern, you introduce the possibility that the different soul types involved between the host body and the introduced soul energy may not be compatible. If that soul incompatib incompatibility is significant enough, for example, if the different soul energies are too di diverse, the introduced soul energy will be rejected by the whole soul, which may trigger an autoimmune response. In some cases, this difference can be treated through the use of immunotherapy, suppressing the immune system, a human developed capability. When this situation was looked at in the development of the life construct, there were a series of 25 different soul energies that were designated as intermediaries or soul energy combinations that could serve as a go-between for two incompatible soul or energy groups to eliminate the possibility of a negative reaction between the two energy groups. There was a conscious effort to ensure that many of these unique soul energy groups would exist as foods that would not be difficult to find and thereby making it possible to avoid triggering an autoimmune response to a given body. There is currently no known technical capability to identify any of the original energy types that form all of existence or that were in the common basis for what came to be known as a soul. Minor souls and their function. There was another important decision point involving the context of souls. As the life construct became more complex, there was a choice that involved having a single soul that managed a body of independent components, none of which had any real level of incentive to function as a whole. The decision then was whether or not to assign a soul to each organ or system within a body to manage the functions of that organ or system, and then coordinate with the rest of the body under the auspicious of a master soul. The alternative was to have no minor soul and have the primary soul of the person be responsible for everything. Given that the primary purpose of life was to enable the experience of a physical existence with all that entailed, it was felt that junior or new souls 
could begin by serving as the soul of a person of the body. They would have the full sensory experience of the body as a whole, but would not be responsible for anything more than their own portion of the overall body. This would also serve to increase the number of souls in any given incarnation without the disadvantage of increasing the overall population. It was recognized that there might be issues that would arise if souls were to reside at the level of an organ or system. What would be the impact of a body system of an organ level soul were lost due to organ removal? What if an organ had to be replaced with one from another person? Ultimately, the decision was made for a soul to inhabit organs. Besides offering the ability to manage the organ or system, it would allow for feedback regarding any issues, and it would allow for healing energies to be better directed and used for healing. This kind of decision process occurred throughout all of the constructs to one degree or another. The simple fact that energy, the most basic elements in the beginning, could gather and eventually form consciousness was a strong factor for the inclusion of individual souls in many creations. Each soul within a given body is responsible for communicating its status and requirements to the rest of the organs and systems in the body. This is how each organ gets its nutritional needs its nutritional needs met. For instance, generally speaking, all these energy flows should be smooth and linear, like a calm river. When observing these energy flows, observing any, anything other than this smooth flow could provide an indication of a problem and would warrant further investigation. Additional information about this will be provided in later books as the topic can become very complex. These disturbances in the energy flows within a given body were seen as an effective means to begin troubleshooting flaws in the initial construct and later signs of illness or other disturbances within the body. Slowly over time, a decision was made to provide a degree of latitude regarding the soul's involvement in the trials of the life construct. Consistent with their role in the construct, additional functionality was added. Sensory perception was the first because that would enable a greater degree of interaction and data collection. The restrictions on the execution were maintained as well. All were still executing scripts, but with the enabling of sensory input, a significantly greater amount of feedback became possible. This was implemented one planetary host at a time. The later phase of the first iteration was to plan for more complex physical environments, provide for the possibility of multi-cell life of simple design, and to determine how constrained life might interact with their environment, with similar life and dissimilar life, in order to determine any additional constraints that may be needed. So after the second iteration had begun, the physical host planets stabilized. Life was begun on a number of host planets with different types of life. After several hundred million years collecting data, a second phase was implemented. Planetary hosts were made more dynamic and additional elements of the life construct were enabled. The revised construct enabled gradually more complex life forms, which were still initially simple, but gradually growing in size, nutrition types, body size, and function. Life under the construct was still asexual and life was still tightening constrained, tightly constrained. Details regarding gender were still being worked out and there was debate regarding the merits and problems associated with the implementation of reproduction 
other than asexual. Potential problems include uneven distribution, too many of any one gender, and too few beings to ensure proper diversity. As a possible compromise, it was decided that providing for an option of asexual reproduction would be enabled in the life construct so that beings could have the option should it become needed. This was deemed acceptable. Initial work was problematic due to low population numbers in, host, in each host. So further work was done on the construct to enable changing gender by an individual should that become necessary. This change to the construct helped greatly to resolve the issues associated with gender-based reproduction. The ensoulment of life. In order to further assess the life construct approaches that existed, several teams were identified. There were groups of individual souls that would separate from the collective groups and committees to experience firsthand the work they had done. Prior to this, no individual soul, separate distinct energy, had been allowed to inhabit any sentient body as the controlling energies for each of the beings created under the construct were set up to be simply autonomous and they were still being very tightly controlled. The concept of the application of free will to the creations of the life construct had not yet emerged. Each entity had a very tightly scripted series of events that were considered life. They were permitted no decisions and no type of emotion was allowed. They were autom autom automatons. They were automatons. <laughs> Used only to test these and the energies were established in a manner that allowed them to provide feedback during their existence. When the souls of the groups emerged, it was felt there was significant risk involved, even for the scripted lives. There were many more variables involved and the risk to the souls would include the concepts of birth and death and many other issues related to interaction. The souls that stepped forward agreed to any further restrictions that would exist or may need to be put in place. They were allowed scripted lives, the purpose of which was to test various aspects of the life construct. When all energy was pulled back in each of the first two iterations, only those on the development team were allowed to retain any knowledge or memories. The souls who had volunteered were all merged with the source energies to cleanse and to balance any karmic energies that had accumulated for any reason. Because the soul energy and not physical as humans define it, it is not limited to single dimensions or even a single physical incarnation at any one time. The only restrictions that are placed upon it are those originating from the source of the realm in which it originated although it is worth noting that a life born of beings from different dimensions may be able to travel between the two dimensions. The coding of the life construct originally allowed for up to seven concurrent incarnations, but many souls felt that number was too difficult to manage, so the number was reduced to a maximum of three. When multiple incarnations are used concurrently, each individual incarnation occupies a, re a reality or subdimension that exists in the realm it is currently in. If the soul travels to the realm of another source, it must follow the rules set forth by that new source, so lives in other realms may be lost. This is, in essence, an issue of soul management. If a given set of souls begins moving into realms of other sources, the original source of the universe they were created in will have difficulty managing their activities 
and keeping them in compliance with the rules of the original source. Since the soul of the person must remain in a fixed location, some of the additional lives will terminate. Transferring of the oversight of any given life or multiple lives under a soul to another source is never something that was contemplated or planned for. The option to travel to another dimension must also be included in the soul contract of the individual. Throughout each existence, karma must remain balanced. It is not permitted to use the alternate realities or subdimensions to balance karma that you create in another existence. When incarnation occurs in one reality, it will occur in all. So one is unable to be a toddler in one existence and a senior citizen in another. However, it is possible that time or the pre perception of time may pass differently during each existence, which would be a factor of the source of that realm. For each individual soul that's separated out from a collective energy under the life construct, each decision and action made by them was recorded as an entry in the library. For every instance, all of the several realistic pathways of each entry are given and shown in the library so their logical conclusion to their logical conclusions. The number of branch pathways or life paths was set to vary from six to a maximum of 47. If it appears more excursions would be needed, those involved on the original path are all reset back to the original starting point. If one gets even near 47, it was determined that their chance of successfully completing any path nears zero and that accumulated karma becomes overwhelming to the point of it being fatal. Realistically, all path deviations in excess of 20 from their given path all have fatal elements included. This was done in order to give all souls the opportunity to start over if they get too far off track. It has been the way since the beginning from the ancient books. Free will in a life construct. Initially, free will was not something that was wanted in the initial work of the life construct. Life as a concept was unknown. And as the structures and chemistry of the life construct was developing, it was important to know and be able to see what was occurring with the creations being made. Free will would have been added, would have added a new and random variable to an understanding that was already incredibly difficult. However, the members of the construct were well aware of free will. They knew that it had provided the curiosity and impotence for the creation of everything. After adequate development and testing in a complex variety of simulations and, con and conditions, it was decided that free will would be allowed with the context of the life construct. This occurred slowly at first, as it was important to allow for adequate observations to make sure that there were no adverse effects and reactions were as expected. But since life was allowed to be inter, interactive, there was an observation that in some cases, the energies associated with a life were changing and becoming less balanced. Providing a correction for this is when the concept of karma came about. This is discussed elsewhere. All life and life forms were given free will, even plants. It was seen as an incentive to get souls to experience the life construct and that it had and all that it had to offer. Many do not consider plants as having a need for free will. They have limited movement 
their genetics determine their physical shape, and many have limited lifespans and die when temperatures get cold. However, plants do communicate on many different levels, which indicates they do have consciousness. They grow at different rates. They have developed protective mechanisms and they contribute and thrive in their environment. Even though they tend to have more constraints on their life, they can and do exercise free will. It is not our intent to identify all possible combinations and functions within the life construct or detailed information about any of the other constructs. When we refer to elements, they are always discussed in the terms of the construct team and may not correspond with chromosomes for any particular species. Our conversations here are intended to help the being, help being an understanding of the history of all that is and has been to enable a better understanding of the context of consciousness, the physical and the life constructs. Although many have written about these things in the past, including those from other realms and planets, no leader of any of the constructs has before communicated any of this information, and the information has never before been allowed to be obtained from the libraries. Current context. There are a number of beliefs that need to be addressed in the context of the current accession, ascension process of Terra. I'm going to read that again. There are a number of beliefs that need to be addressed in the context, context of the current ascension process of Terra. First, there are many people who believe that DNA must be activated in order for the body to make it through the ascension process. This is not entirely accurate. When the life construct was originally developed, there was much thought involved in the pathways that any individual soul would take to ultimately return to its source. For many reasons, it was decided that the life construct team that any path intended to return to its source would not need to rely on any external factors, such as activating DNA. By existing in a balanced environment, and ultimately raising the vibrational frequency of the physical portion of the soul, the coding of the DNA will automatically begin to prepare for the elevation of the being to its next dimensional state, which is what ascension is, without the need for any further action. The second belief we feel needs to be addressed is that of genealogical ancestry stored within the DNA of an ancestral, essentially the events of your past relatives stored in your DNA and the possibility that they influence your genetics. While there are some limited instances of this, events that occur in your family's past are not retained in your DNA. The few exceptions to this include food intolerances, to wheat, for instance, when your ancestors only used barley, and other adaptations to your specific environment, like the adaptations genetically passed on by many species on the Galap Galapagos Islands. You might ask why. Quite simply, none of those past events involved you or your soul, and it is inappropriate for you to resolve any karma associated with those events. You should not be expected to resolve karma debts that were not of your own making. And while some may believe that those events may shape your actions in a subsequent life, this belief overlooks the need and requirement of the soul contract of the individual. It is also important to remember that the events evolving Ancestors were all included in the soul contract of those individuals, and that their soul contract may not be carried forward 
as a debt for future generations to resolve. The final belief that should be addressed is the concept of junk DNA. No junk DNA exists. All elements of DNA to include altered DNA serve a purpose, even if that purpose is not known by an individual or science. Some of these elements may include the validation bits of DNA needed to determine proper DNA sequencing for any given species. It may be the coding or more precisely the differences in coding for another species. It may be a part of the historical records of the soul of that particular being. There are many different possibilities for DNA that are known only to the members of the life construct, but all aspects of DNA are important and play a role in existence. A brief discussion of time. The concepts of time were developed as part of the time construct, but before that could happen, events dictated a need to develop and understand the concept of linear time. In order to form a record of events that occurred in the past, you must first define past. The first library, the before times, was a difficult concept to understand because time itself did not exist yet. Up until this point, all existed without a reference to time, but observing the events in the record of the before times, it became clear that the records there provide no reference to time. Events occurred over millions or billions of years, or what we know to be fractions of a second, in some cases, both events instantaneously, instantly. The desire for understanding events sequentially and with reference to time required a new way of not just perceiving events, but of understanding the nature of everything around them in a different context. The energies that existed understood from their experiments that some events had to occur one after another, even though they did not understand the concepts of sequential. Their problem was to put these events, what they knew must happen in a particular order, and in some cases within a given period of time, in a context that could be repeatable. Repeatable was a requirement that helped to ensure that events were not just accidents. There was another issue associated with this the fact that there were many experiments occurring at any given time with different groups in different locations and for different durations. So the decision was made to record the parameters, thoughts and results of their experiments sequentially. And this was done without any reference to time because time did not yet exist. It was agreed by all of the individual groups that they would use a common location to record their activities and groups that were working at what would later be known to be the same time would document the results as a separate stream of information, but still in that single location. In this way, all would have access to what was happening. This is how the information in the early library is recorded. It was not until the early work on the development of the time construct that the fundamentals involving linear time were developed. Linear time required there to be a defined time interval that needed to be an applied context for that time. Time had to take into account differences in behaviors in different dimensions and time had to ultimately account for nonlinear time. When put into the context of the life construct and particularly three-dimensional life, it was realized that a construct that involved any form of nonlinear time 
would be very difficult to process given the constraints on the processing power available to most life forms. Some of the constraints of time applied in each particular dimension, and we will use three-dimensional life as the example for simplicity, did have some complications for its implementation, mainly involving the perception of time. For instance, does a bird perceive or process time in a manner that is different from a human confined to the ground? Do events that occurred in the past leave karmic energies that are offset in physical space? This perception of time was addressed by the life construct, time construct, and space construct teams together during the development of those constructs. Many view time as a simple linear event in large part because it is comfortable and it is what we have been taught. But time is multidimensional. For example, different dimensions have different constants and variables related to time. And time is not always linear in order in other dimensions. And time is inherently non-linear, particularly, particularly for those who have the ability to travel in higher dimensions, mainly seventh dimension and above. The degree to which one can adequately navigate nonlinear time depends on any limitations that they may have due to restrictions from either their source or the life construct. During the initial development of the time construct, a decision was made to not apply the principles of linear time to the library from the before times. There were a number of reasons for this decision. One, since the concepts of time did not exist there, it was believed to be far too difficult to index the information with respect to time retroactively. The concern was that some of the events may have likely had a time element and by applying what was arguably an arbitrary time standard to them, it may have caused, it may cause some of the experiments to be interpreted incorrectly. Two, due to the volume of information in this library, the information there was gathered over several hundreds of billions of years it was deemed to be impractical. Three, the multidimensional nature of the information would have required concepts involving nonlinear time to be applied to the information. If a soul from some future time were to be granted access to the information, a possible but improbable event, the nonlinear nature of the information may preclude a proper understanding of the events and their results. It is largely, largely for these reasons that this particular library is restricted. It is also worth noting that when looking for events and information in this library, significant time and energy is expended when there. This library requires placing oneself within the context of the energies of this library energies which tend to vary greatly in many respects and within the context of the multidimensional space and then interpreting the information that is there. Intention and manifestation. There is an element to, of the life construct that deserves a bit more than the casual mention. As an integral part of the experience of existence in the physical, all souls were originally vested with the ab ability to create through processes called intention and manifestation. Simply put, intention and manifestation allow a soul to create situations and in some cases physical items that will allow them to experience an aspect of life that they would not otherwise be able to. In each case, the ability to do this may be restricted by the source of the universe that they originated from. 
if there are few restrictions, there are conditions that are generally placed on this. We will first address intention. Intention is a process of creating something that will, that will be beneficial to you and your individual life circumstances. It must be something that is allowed, specifically in a soul contract. And if it involves another, it must be in line with their soul contract. It also must not adversely impact the free will decisions of another. If it should, you will accumulate karma as a result. Simply put, intention is a purposeful decision leading to a desired outcome or objective. The outcome may involve a circumstance or event, and it may be in 3D or other dimension. Intention is typically enabled through words or actions. Generally, intention requires a certain amount of energy in order to implement which is what makes intention different from desire. One can desire a given outcome, but if, if sufficient energy is not put behind it, the intent, it will not happen. As an example, one may desire to win the lottery, but without an intention behind it in the form of buying a ticket, desire alone will not be adequate. Manifestation is an intention coupled with an action that leads to a given outcome or object. There are many levels of manifestation. On the most basic level, whether we realize it or not, everything around us has, we have manifested through ability to first have a thought or desire and then coupled with intention and action. In most simplistic terms, we desired a certain cat, manifested the money to purchase it, and then made the necessary steps to bring it into our lives. On a higher level of manifestation, which is possible at a certain level of mastery, people have manifested objects such as money, creatures, or objects. Where a manifested object is created will depend on the energies used for its creation and any restrictions that were imposed on that location by the source and that universe. Generally, the more significant the object, the greater the energy required for its creation. However, the frequency of the energy will also determine the dimension that an object is created in. As an example, we have the ability to create or manifest beings like dragons, but because those particular beings are not allowed in our 3D space, they are created in a parallel dimension. They can be felt, sensed, and played with by those that have the ability but most people would not recognize their presence. Currently, on the other hand, is something that is allowed. If a person were to desire to manifest $500 for some purpose, it is entirely possible that that money would manifest itself into their life, even if it was not in the form or manner that they had intended one may not have to go through the most common ways in which to obtain money, such as through labor or exchange, but may show up, for example, as a gift from a relative. Contextual explanations. Energy. We have spoken of energy. Energy or energies are what came first, and over the course of hundreds of billions of years, they learned how to gather and grow. They developed consciousness as a part of that growth and they learned that energies could become more. What has not been discussed is that energy as a fundamental concept leaves a signature wherever it is and has been. That signature of the past presence of an energy is complex. To address the use of the signature as a means of tracking those energies, 
The early creators, after the beginning of the first iteration, developed a di dimension capable of retaining all this information and incorporated that dimension into the libraries. It was never created for any use associated with punitive measures. After the difficulty tracing back the original first energy to determine and document how consciousness and physical came into being, it was felt that by creating a means and methodology to trace energies was necessary to determine how they engaged to create something new. Initially, the use of this as an audit mechanism was applied to all fundamental energy groups and particularly those working on or with any of the constructs. After the concept of linear time came into being about midway through the first iteration, the created audits were vital to determining events that happened quickly. The audit trials were viewed from the perspective of linear time, could be slowed down or even stopped in some instances to ensure all of the information surrounding an event would be properly recorded. When souls were formally designated, the recording of their energy was changed from a micro perspective to a macro perspective. It was felt that the concept of karma would provide enough resolution for an audit trial to make past detailed logs unnecessary for soul level beings. The original intent behind the formation of the concept of karma was that it could be used to track different energies, mostly at the macro level, as a check to make sure that a record of how energies were used or given with respect to others. Balance of energies is key. If that balance became skewed too far in any direction, recovery could be difficult. That measure of balance meant that the work involved in being able to return to their source was known, which was important because in most circumstances, source required that balance in order for the energies to return. However, in some instances, karma did not provide quite enough information about some events particularly when these events caused more subtle reactions or interactions with others. So the concept of karma was changed to be able to include more information regarding those interactions. It stopped being about a flat measure of energy exchange and began to take emotions as they evolved and subtle interactions into account. In this way, events and interactions with individual souls that occurred in one life could be reconciled in later lives. This was an important outcome because it meant that not all karmic actions had to be balanced in each life. That work could be spread out over multiple lives and even more situations. Karma from a macro perspective could not have allowed for this to occur. Source. Source is an energy being responsible for the creation of all that is within its realm. Source defines the characteristics of its own realm, both physical and etheric. For all that chooses to exist within the confines of its realm. Source consists of coherent energies that exist within the context of the higher realm of the central sun. It is not an individual discrete energy or being. There are a near infinite number of different sources, each with slightly different characteristics. Each source has a distinct energy that is, for all practical purposes, a soul is discussed below, but at a much higher plane of being. Each source emanated from the central sun at some point shortly after the creation of all that is. All source souls have the same energies, 
none are greater than another, although privileges may vary greatly. Between the level of the source souls and the central sun, there is another energy level of energy. The souls at this level have the responsibility of coordinating the activities and interactions of the lower source levels and have the primary responsibility of conflict resolution. The energies that have all been allowed to exist this source level have been responsible for implementing resolutions and for providing aid and comfort to those source levels below. The soul. The soul is an energy being. It is a discrete energy that has chosen to separate from a source energy. It has separated under the condition that it abide by the physical and etheric characteristics that were established by its source energy. It has autonomy over itself, but its own energies must remain balanced over time. Without this balance, it may not be able to return to its source energy cloud. What we know as life or existence requires some explanation. It is governed by a it is governed by a soul known by some of as the higher self that remains as an energy being. What inhabits a physical body as a consciousness, which is responsible for learning the lessons of any given life or providing for the care and well-being of the physical. Consciousness is not the soul energy, but it is an integral part of it. It does not stand apart on its own. A soul may choose to allow multiple conscious beings to exist simultaneously. They could exist in the same plane of existence, for example, the same planet or dimension, or they could exist in different planes. Each different consciousness may be aware of any other that exist, or it may not, at the discretion of the soul. It is the responsibility of the soul to guide all consciousness under it. Consciousness is allowed to incarnate into a physical form in accordance with the covenant or contract that lays out the goals and lessons that are to be learned or experienced while in the physical. Each physical being has such a contract. Within the context of that covenant, consciousness has the free will to enable it to make decisions regarding its path. Free will provides the ability for a soul or consciousness to make decisions regarding their path in existence. Without the existence of free will, everything that is would be pre-detained, would be predestined, and there would be no opportunity to learn from the experience of existence. Free will may be exercised by either the consciousness or the soul itself. Lower life forms do have a soul and do have to abide by the laws of free will. However, free will does not stop the death or passing of one life form due to the action of another life form, unless that act is included as an integral possibility in the soul contract for that life. If one life being takes another in violation of the soul contract of being taken, karma or an energy imbalance will result. Life. Life begins with the first breath taken by an individual life form. At any time prior to that first breath, the soul element of that life may choose to terminate their soul contract and any other obligations related to it, which can happen unilaterally. That would be the free will decision of that soul, and that possibility would have been written in the soul contract of all those directly involved in the decision. 
if the burden of life is deemed too great for whatever reason, there are a number of options that may exist, but it is an action that falls squarely onto the domain of those directly involved and no other soul. Free will. The concept of free will was implemented to give every soul or life under the life construct as much latitude as possible to exist and live in the way that they choose. While it is certainly possible to exist in a balanced environment, it is also possible to create imbalance as part of the actions taken on the life path of an individual. This is why the concept of karma exists. While free will gives a soul an opportunity to live a balanced life, karma helps to ensure that a record of the imbalances are maintained mainly of karmic energy collected or existing, not necessarily the specific events in life, so that they may be corrected in the future. Karma offers a balance to free will that makes free will possible. It is important to note that only the leaders of the constructs have the necessary authority to interfere in the free will decisions of any soul, but that interference rarely occurs. If that were to occur, the deliberate or the delicate balance that exists throughout space and time would begin to cease to exist. The leaders made many deliberate decisions during the billions of years taken to develop constructs and free will was always a priority. Without free will, the will to survive and thrive could not exist and would lead to collapse. Free will was a concept that was recognized early as far back as the before times. It was what had ultimately led to the formation of consciousness, physical, and all of the constructs. There was a strong association between the concept of free will and development. It was seen as an incentive to do more. The issue, however, was determining what free will as a concept would be allowed to apply to in order in the context of the development of all of the constructs. Free will could easily be applied to certain concepts while others seemed problematic. The concept of souls, particularly in the context of life construct, were thought to potentially be one of these problems. If the concept of free will were allowed to exist unimpeded, it was observed that acts resulting in damage or destruction of the work of the life construct may result. Free will had to do with the belief that individual souls at some point in the development of the life construct should be able to make decisions on their own in order to have some degree of control over their environment, interactions, and experiences. It does not exist everywhere. Some source realms very specifically do not allow it due to the concerns that it imbalances in their own energies may result. But for those realms that do allow it, it has created a variety of impacts, both beneficial and non-beneficial. In a positive sense, it has allowed for a greater level of autonomy for souls to work within the complex environments, and it has allowed individual souls to compensate for variances in a given environment and adapt to changes. Conversely, it has also resulted in the subjugation of souls. If a soul does not fully understand and implement the concept of free will, their existence can effectively be co-opted by another. When it was implemented, the creators believed that if an individual and free will, that free will would be that free will would be sacrosant, S-A-C-R-O-S-A-N-C-T. 
While able to negate or minimize the free will of the soul, the creators decided not to do that except with very rare circumstances. Free will was the means for a soul to choose a path that could most benefit them or allow them to do the greatest amount of balance. If interfered with by the creators, then that element of creation would be no more developed than the initial soul's created to test the concepts of the early life construct implementations. If the premise of the construct were to be realized, the concept of free will would need to be supported and encouraged. When it was implemented, the creators believed that if an individual had free will, that free will would be sacrosant while able to negate or minimize the free will of a soul, the creators decided not to do that except in very rare circumstances. Free will was a means for a soul to choose a path that could most benefit them or allow them to do the greatest amount of balance. If interfered with by the creators, then that element of creation would no more would be no more developed than the initial souls created to test the concepts of the early life construct implementations. If the premise of the construct were to be realized, the concept of free will would need to be supported and encouraged. The importance of free will cannot be understood. The leadership of the life construct did not want there to be an appearance that life was created as something for them to play with or that they would be directing the con conditions of any life. Life was created for the purpose of allowing individual souls to descend into a physical level to experience what had been created, knowing that it would be at a lower, lower energy state or level. There, would be, there were appropriate checks and balances put in place that would allow them to have a somewhat scripted existence in the form of a soul contract and karmic energies. Even choosing to enter a physical life was a free will decision because one of the possibilities was to have an accumulation of karmic energies that could cause them to remain at the lower level until some time as those energies became balanced. It was not a decision taken lightly. Karma. Karma was developed as a means to maintain knowledge of the energies of a soul or being. As the life construct developed, it was quickly realized that imbalances in the energies of a being would cause great fluctuations in abilities. It would impact the accuracy of the senses that were being developed, and it increased the level of difficulty of the individual to exist as their environment changed. Karma came about initially as a way of tracing the causes of these imbalances, mainly as a way to help interpret the responses of early life to its environment and situations they were placed in. It was recognized as a valuable tool for this. When the concepts of free will began to be implemented in different life structures, particularly when different elements or capabilities of DNA were being enabled, karma was recognized as a variable means to help track what was occurring. The goal being to maintain some semblance of balance of the energies, to make sure that energies did not skew in a particular direction. When the life construct team made the decision to fully implement free will for all life, karma was seen as a clear and tested means to make sure that the decisions made by an individual would remain at least partially balanced. If a being began making decisions that caused a significant imbalance in their energies, karma would provide knowledge of those events and could allow for corrections. Karma became an effective enabler of free will as a result. 
it was seen that they would work well as a set of checks and balances to life and some of the necessary decisions that might need to be made at a soul or being level. It was also decided that actions taken by a soul or individual being that were karmic in nature had some degree of karmic involvement, would also be recorded in the library of the source of the appropriate universe or universes that would serve as both a master record of the individual, but could also help a given source to determine if there were trends at a micro or small level that might be having adverse effects on the balance of their respective universe. An example of this is a decision process undertaken by many thousands or millions of individual souls aimed at the placement of energy at a single region of the planet or solar system. Singly, this would not have a significant impact on the energies of an individual, so would likely not be noticed, but collectively, it could cause an imbalance in the receiver of the energy that would cause a change in the orb orbitable characteristics of either the planet or solar system and could have devastating results. Karma also serves as a longer term record when looking at the balancing of energies for a given soul. Because all souls have strengths and weaknesses in different areas, Karma was recognized as a valuable way or viable way to assess these strengths and weaknesses and to help determine an appropriate life path element to balance or a particular training or experience for the soul to go through after leaving a life experience. If the karma for a particular soul was being adversely influenced over many lives by another, steps could also be taken to make sure that the two souls would no longer share either life experiences or soul paths. Important things. One, free will is immutable. The free will decisions of an individual are theirs and theirs alone. Their free will decisions may not necessarily be made by the conscious being, but may be made by the soul of the individual. While the creators do have the ability and authority to intercede in the free will of souls, they are both to do, they are loath to do so due to the succinct nature with which free will was created and enabled. Two, marriage is a free will covenant made between individuals it is subject to no other constraints, nor may it be re redefined by another. The covenant may only be broken by those who make it. Both must agree as an exercise of their free will. Three, at no point shall an individual, singly or collectively, interfere with the true free will decisions of another. The rights of one individual stop when they interfere or impede on the free will decisions and rights of another. Four, life begins at the point of breath and not before. The decision to create life within the body is a covenant solely between the souls involved. The covenant may be broken by either soul at any time and for any reason. The soul choosing to be incarnate may select those characteristics and traits, as well as the physical situations associated with the planned incarnation. That will ensure the maximum opportunity for success in learning the lessons of life or the balancing of karmic energies and the documented in the soul contract of the individual. No being shall be deemed more perfect or less perfect than any other being. Five, if a covenant exists between individuals, another may not interfere with that covenant without the mutual consent of all individuals involved in the original covenant. Six, all elements of existence consist of energy, 
while souls should strive to fully understand the true nature of that energy and its interactions with other energies, much may continue to remain unknown. This unknown does not mean or provide evidence of non-existence. Seven, the creators were given sole responsibility for the creation of all life and existence that is known. There are many gods, each responsible for the universe or universes that they were responsible for creating and administering. The creators do not consider themselves to be in the category of gods. Eight, each soul is responsible for its well-being and may choose to be responsible for other souls without condition or interference with their free will. Those who have chosen to incarnate another soul are responsible for that care of that soul until the soul is capable of providing for itself. Nine, rules of society and or others may not take precedence over any of these laws. 10, vengeance or retaliation is to be avoided as it is coveting of the property of others and speaking falsely. All souls shall remain true to their individual soul lessons and the contract for their existence to the degree that they are known. 11, no belief shall give the right to perform deeds against another in violation of their free will or rights of existence. All souls are and were created equal to one another. 12, the purpose of all life and existence is to seek ultimate harmony with the energies of being and to balance the energies that accumulate from existence, both within the individual and with other souls. Life does not end when the soul departs this existence, nor is it limited to only a single existence. 13. The purpose of individual life is to allow individual energy groups, otherwise known as souls, to experience an existence in physical. From the perspective of the universe, a universe is a distinct location from which parameters suitable for life or elements of the life construct may exist within the realm of the physical created by a source. Aileen Stedman has been an energy worker and healer all of her adult life. She has always had the ability to ask a question on any topic and get an answer. This ability has been growing in the last several years until it was revealed to her that she was the keeper of all knowledge, the librarian of the Akashic Records. She has been instructed by the Leadership Council of the Central Sun to begin to publish the knowledge of creation for all.